Hello, everyone, and welcome to the final panel of the summit. So let's get started. Why do companies exist? Well, obviously, it's to deliver a service or a product, but it, they all come down to one specific reason, and that's to create a profit. However, corporate social responsibility shows us that profitability and responsibility are not mutually exclusive, but are in fact byproducts of one another. In the wake of back-to-back -back global crises in the last decades, longevity and resilience are critical characteristics to be adopted. CSR is a forefront in the realm of crisis management, maintaining economic stability, and finding a balance between what the human wants and what the environment needs. This panel is named after the urgent words of Greta Thunberg, our house is on fire. And on this panel, we will explore the feasibility of CSR within the current climate and its rules. Now, it's time to introduce our wonderful panelists who are so inspired and so passionate about sustainability in the hospitality industry. Hello, panelists. Hello. Hello. So I'll get started with your introductions. And first we have Miss Portia Hart. Would you care to give us a wave? Hello. Having lived, studied, worked in England, Scotland, Japan, France, Monaco, and Colombia, Portia is, has a true international outlook, personally, professionally, and academically. She is dedicated to the incorporation of sustainable and regen regenerative practices into business operations so that tourism becomes a source of regrowth and not one of destruction. She's also the founder of Blue Apple Beach and is a standard barrier for all regenerative travel. All right, and up next is Miss Amanda Ho. She is the co-founder of Regenerative Travel. She is the brand architect behind developing regenerative travel as a market leader for regenerative and sustainable travel. She honed her skills as an editor-in-chief at Electrify Magazine as a storyteller, producer, and creative strategist across many aspects of the luxury industry. After that, we have Mr. Neil Jacobs whose passion for wellness and sustainability and making travel more meaningful led him, to be create, led him to create Six Senses in 2012. He has sought out to broaden the company's global footprint by enabling people to experience the Six, Sen Six Senses getaway cities and adopting the brand's value of sophistication and contemporary urban environments. Under his leadership, the company has opened resorts in some of the most exotic places around the world, including Cambodia, Fiji, and Bhutan. And then up next, we have Mr. Tim Wyland, the general manager of the beautiful Alpina Gestad. Uh, he, he built a global career with working with the Amman Group, and he has learned to live the multicultural and diverse world of international hospitality. He embraces and he follows the ideal of respect for natural resources and the local environment, working on bringing these elements closer to guest experiences. And we'd like to introduce and welcome back to our YHS stage, Ms. Anita Mandarata, Special Advisor to the Secretary General of the UNWTO and President at Anita Mandarata and Associates. You may have recognized her from RISE earlier this week. So Ms. Mandarata, Please, the panel, the floor is yours once again. Stunning. Thank you so much. And I must say, I'm thrilled to be back on the YHS stage. Leaders, friends and colleagues from around the global travelers and tourism community, all protocols observed, as we say in the UN, welcome to this very important panel discussion. And I'm grateful for the fact that it is not just the final discussion of YHS 2021, it's the finale of YHS 2021. So we've got a great lineup of speakers, superb panel, and in classic YHS style, exactly the right topic at exactly the right time. And if the title of this session, Our House is on Fire, doesn't catch your attention, nothing will. But this one's going to be different for a couple of reasons, and I'll explain. But before I do that, I wanted to share a message from the Secretary General of the UNWTO, who says this, as Secretary General of the UNWTO, central to my leadership of the global membership community, is ensuring that tourism recovery is safe, smooth, united, and sustainable. 
economically, socially, culturally, and environmentally. Today's YHS discussion on sustainability within the hospitality sector is critical in in to ensure that we do not waste this opportunity to embed the principles of equitable growth for people, places, and planet at the heart of all of our efforts. I, as the Secretary General, applaud and thank YHS for their enduring commitment to the future leadership of our essential sector. So from Zira Pololekashvili, Secretary General, enormous applause and congratulations to everyone at YHS. So as has been discussed, this is an important panel. Our discussion is going to be talking about travel, tourism and hospitality as we look to it tomorrow, the future of our sector and making sure that as the Secretary General says, we do not waste this time. Mother Nature must have been a tourism and hospitality practitioner because she knew that we were growing so rapidly, we were not willing to pause and course correct. We weren't willing to actually stop and think, how do we really make sure that all of the growth we are achieving is benefiting everyone? How do we therefore make sure that we are looking at the core purpose of our sector, the economic social impact of our sector, and importantly, the role of corporate social responsibility? The timing of this panel is vital, but many of you might be asking, but why? We've been talking about this for a long time. That's exactly the point. We've been talking about it, but are we doing anything about it? And now that we all have been grounded with borders and skies closed, doors closed, now is the time to re-engineer forward. We saw at the peak of the pandemic, 100% closure of borders across the world, 16,000 commercial aircraft were grounded, over 6 million people were displaced due to restrictions, single digit hotel occupancies, mainly because they were, many mainly because they were hosting heroic frontline workers, and a complete breakage in travel confidence. This is the first time our world has experienced a completely democratic crisis. It is, a it is hitting everyone around the world. It is invisible, so it's hitting us all at a primal level because we don't know, is it in the room or is it not? And it's rewired us all to stay apart. So building confidence is going to be about trust. But how do we make sure that we are going to build into a new model of tourism and hospitality that's going to bring us again all of the success we had in the past? One in 10 jobs worldwide, 80% of SMEs being supported by our sector, 10% of global GDP. So we're going to look at what exactly is the industry going to do to build forward better, to really look at sustainability as part of the DNA. And as I said, in classic YHS style, we have five fantastic speakers with us, four rather, I'm looking at the screen of five blocks. We've already been introduced to Amanda, to Portia, to Neil and to Tim. So to you all, a very warm, very sincere welcome to the YHS virtual stage. And thank you for being with us from across the world. Neil, if I can ask you to start, where in the world are you right now? Well, hi to you and to everybody. I'm in Singapore tonight. Uh, this is home for me between there and New York, but this is where I've been for the last 12 months. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for giving us your evening time. We're very grateful. Tim, where in the world are you? We've just closed the hotel in Switzerland and I'm now uh, back in France, which is what I call home for, for the moment. Stunning. And Portia, yourself? I'm in uh, sunny Colombia in Cartagena on the northern coast. So uh, good evening, Neil. It's early in the morning for me. Yeah. <laughs> and Amanda, yourself, whereabouts are you? Thanks so much for having me. I'm in Hong Kong. I call Hong Kong home now. I've been here for the last 12 months. I've been previously from New York. Incredible. So if we look at it, we technically have six destinations on board because I'm normally in London, but I send you a house it from Cape Town. So we've got Singapore, Cape Town and London. We've got France, Colombia and we have Hong Kong. So YHS, you're bringing the world to this audience and thank you for that. Now, all of my lovely speakers have been warned that we're going to have a conversation that as much as it's about sustainability, we've all been sitting looking at screens for the last year plus, and what we don't want to do is recycle this conversation. We want to get close and personal about what people really think about this issue, and in many ways, how this past year has shifted our commitment and our actions going forward around especially corporate responsibility, social, corporate, corporate social responsibility. I'm gonna ask you all a question. 
and I want you to dig deep. So put your business cards aside, but I want to know from each of you, starting with Amanda, how do you define sustainability? Thank you, Anita. Well, sustainability to me is, is really about your mindset and outlook as a human in everyday life. You know, how can I make a difference? It's the little things that I think that really make the biggest impact. It's about doing the right thing to make a, to make a meaningful difference to the world around us. You know, if there's something that is inherently a difficult choice, it's choosing the more difficult route to do what is right for ourselves and for nature. Um, I really believe that sustainability is the first step to regenerate and replenish and repair what we have done the damage to this earth. You know, we're at a point where there is no planet B. I think my generation and the generation of Gen Z, especially are on the front lines of being what I think is being a bedroom activist. Um, you know, they're hearing the call to actively communicate their frustrations on not only the environmental side, but the social side. Look at Black Lives Matter, um, the recent Stop Asian, Stop Asian Hate campaign, there's a renewed call for social justice, and it's really getting to the heart of how we can create, create you know, this systemic change that is deep-rooted within our society. Um, you know, for a really simplistic view, sustainability is around, is about reaching that neutral, where regeneration is actually changing the core of the system and making it better. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I love the fact you're talking about systemic change. It's not purely organic and it's not necessarily focusing on just the immediate impact itself. <clears throat> How do you define sustainability? I'm probably going to throw the cat among the pigeons here. Um, I actually try not to use the word sustainability. Uh, and it's not a concept that I talk about much because for me, sustainability is the status quo. As you mentioned, it's something we've been talking about for a long time and not acting on. Well, not we, a lot of people in our industry, and, and you know, we've got some pioneers in this group, have been acting on the concept of sustainability. But I, as a relatively um, newcomer to the industry, found that when I opened my hotel, sustainability meant we don't have plastic straws. And sustainability meant we don't want to pay for an air conditioning unit in our hotel room and we don't want to wash the sheets every day. So we're going to call ourselves an eco lodge and say that we're sustainable. Um, I believe that we shouldn't sustain the status quo. I believe that socially we live in an unjust world. I think we are surrounded by inequality. I think that what we're doing to our environment and our ecosystems are causing untold damage. And if we are to focus on sustaining where we are, we're still gonna end up um, in the proverbial. So when I talk about uh, the way I run my business and the way I see the future of not only travel, but actually life on earth, I try to use words like regeneration. I also spent the last 12 months learning to say it, regenerative. Um, restoration, repair, um, just because it's not because I don't believe in the concept of sustainability. I think sometimes we need semantics to give us a little shove. And I think sustainability as a concept perhaps became something that just got greenwashed, ended up being rolled off the tongue too often, so often was associated only with the environment and not often enough with equality and social justice. So uh, I'm on the kind of more radical standpoint. And I, I think it's, it, it may appear radical, but it's actually very, very focused because I'm a big fan of words that words have meaning. And to your point, what is the opposite of sustainability? If it's not a sustainable business, it's bankrupt. If it's not a sustainable environment or, or a, 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 an element of wildlife, it becomes extinct. So sustainability is it's an interesting one from the point of view of how people choose to use that word. But I love, I love the fact that we have a cat amongst our pigeons. So thank you for that. So Neil, I'm intrigued about your definition because credit where it's due, Six Senses was leading the charge in sustainability before people even had the word in their vocabulary. And I think that's really quite remarkable because you've, you've created it genuinely as part of your DNA. I would love to understand how you define the word, sir. Well, thank you for the kind the kind intro. I, I, I mean, it's it's a word. I mean, we talk about the overuse of the word. It's pretty much as we talk about wellness, you know, because we're we're into both things. They're both overused words. So we come at it really from two directions. And and you're right, though, as as a group, Six Senses has been practicing and functioning sustainably for for close to 30 years now but you know from the from a nuts and bolts perspective 
you know, we, we, we tend to kind of break it down to its simplest parts and, and we, we look at it from the perspective of the built environment, you know, how we build things, what we build with, what are the materials we use. And I mean, very, very diligent about, about that and, and ensuring that all materiality and processes are not harming anybody or, any, or anything. Then it's obviously about how you operate and it, 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 you know, what you use, what are your processes. Um, and, and then it's about the outreach and, and, and community. But, but to me, um, and, and I agree with, with, uh, with Portia and Amanda, absolutely in, in everything they were saying, but, you know, the one word that, that didn't come up, we talked about regeneration or Portia did, but, you know, we talk a lot about reconnection because we, we, we think about it in, in, in relation to, human relationships and how people are coming together, whether that's our guests, whether it's our employees, whether it's guests with employees, in fact, all of our, all of our stakeholders and, and community as well. And, and, and during this time, you know, of COVID, a lot of focus has been put on creating programming around reconnection, um, which, which we also think is a huge part of, um, operating sustainably in in today's world so you know there's so many facets to it um so many and, and as i say I, I agree with everything that's been said so far but that's really our take on it and to try and uncomplicate it as much as is possible because it, it's it's a bit of, it's overused, but it is a highbrow world and word, and it means so many things to so many people that we just try and ratify what those elements are. Indeed, and I must say, I'm really grateful that we have you on the panel alongside our other great speakers because I I, I must say I enjoyed the fact I think Portia you used the word veteran to describe Neil. It's like oh. You're, you're, you're a veteran, sir, philosophically. <laughs> it is not a reflection of anything else. But importantly, you mentioned a really important word, which was reconnection, because that implies as well, it's active engagement with the issue, not passive engagement, which goes back to the comments made about couch activism and, and the, the danger of that. So I love what you're saying. And You've, you've moved past it because exactly as you said about being highbrow, sadly, the concept of sustainability has become very fashionable. And that's a pity because we, we don't scratch beneath the surface. So I'm looking forward to doing some scratching with you all today to get deeper into this. So, Tim, over to you, sir. How do you define the S word? Well, a lot has been said already, and I agree with everyone. Um, what Portia mentioned, actually, I hadn't thought about before, but Taking a very personal point, my children, I have never used the word sustainability with my children, yet it's probably a topic that we discuss every single day. And I think part of sustainability is not only that creating a better planet for our children, but really creating better people for our planet. And, uh, you know, be that as, as, as a parent, be that as an employer with the with, uh, with the teams that that we work with, or be that as a host in uh, in the hotels, you know, how can we bring across an, an action, you know, bring across action to create people with this awareness, not only that couch awareness, but wanting to get involved. And and again, I've never used the word sustainability with my daughter. She's now eight years old. She's for her own reasons. She's been vegetarian for since she's five. And it's not something we've been pushing, but it's just an awareness which she has, which comes out of the way that we, we try and bring topics across when we're together as a family. And it actually makes me really proud because she's someone who defends these kind of ideas where saying, you know, we need to take care of what we have. We need to make sure that this is passed along. And she herself is an advocate, even in her school, in her primary school, to share these these points without ever, we speak, we speak French at home, but with, without ever having used this word sustainability. I think it's a mindset which has to be more than just a, a, a term, just a, a word which has to be, um, how do you say, determined. 
Indeed. And I, and I love the fact that you said that. And what was really lovely is the full circle you gave of it's a better planet for our children, but also better people for our planet. And that's really lovely that, that it's a 360 degree relationship. It's not one way. So I love what you've all said here. And there's a reason why I asked you this question up front. A, so that we push past the S word and people's default thinking of what it is. B, it also gives everyone that's watching a sense of understanding of who you are and how you interpret this next conversation. So I thank you for that. And thank you for being so honest about it, which begs the question, we've all been grounded. Mother nature sent us back to our rooms for the last year and a bit because we'd all done something wrong and we needed to think about it. I'd like to understand from each of you, I'll give you each 60 seconds. What do you feel is the fundamental shift in understanding around sustainability that has taken place this past year? Tim, from your side, what do you think? What, what difference has this made and how has this helped us? I think we realize how, how weak we are as a, as, a, as a human race, actually. I think the, that, that human superiority above nature and that we can control everything and that we're just going to throw something at it, be it a, a medical solution, be it some kind of chemical invention, be it... Uh, more of this, more of that, more electricity, more water, you know, whatever problem we used to have, you know, drought ridden areas, okay, let's find some way of putting water at it, you know. Um, cold, cold problems, which we might have in, in the Alpine region, no problem, we'll cover it and we'll heat the area, you know. So whatever it is, we've, we've always felt powerful. Hmm. And this time certainly has shown as a species, as, as a human race, and without dividing up, as you said, it's taken everyone into its into its realm indeed rich poor young old in the end everyone is affected and our weaknesses even combined haven't been able to surmount what nature has thrown at us and i think we just need to be very humbled by this indeed i love the fact that you've gone again from the point of your initial comment that we've established how weak we are that's a very there's no gray area around that which is fantastic mm -hmm. amanda what do you think this year has given us when it comes to talking about the S word? I think that, you know, ultimately looking at COVID in the last year, we've all been grounded. I think we've all realized that the pandemic is really just a rehearsal, dress rehearsal for climate change. I think that's really the next, you know, after the pandemic, this is all, this is really what we have to look at as an industry to tackle. I think, you know, sustainability, the S word is going to be the norm. I think every hotel, every every sector of the industry is going to, you know, if you're not doing, you know, these standard practices like eliminating plastic water bottles, getting rid of single waste use plastics, you know, base the the very basics that we believe are the fundamentals of what you have to use in, in operations. I think that's really just going to become the norm. I think for generation is going to be the norm moving forward because we all have to do our part and play our part to really reverse what's coming ahead of us. Stunning, brilliant, thank you. Portia, from your point of view, how has this helped us? Um, I would say that it's, and I, I'm gonna echo Tim here. Uh, when we look at nature, we see something that's really robust. It keeps on going. And when we look at the first 14 days of the pandemic, we saw our society essentially completely collapse. Um, and I think what we've seen is that our society is not robust, which to me is a sign that perhaps the way we had things set up particularly um, in the privileged and, and developed world, uh, is actually quite far removed from nature. And when I look at the wide range of experiences of, of friends of mine living in expensive apartments in London to people living in uh, apartments in New York with children and teaching from home, what I think will be positive from this is that a lot of young people will say, I don't want to go to an office every day and then take two weeks a year and go and travel to as many places as I can in that two weeks and extract as much as I can because I'm exhausted and broken. Uh, I want to set up my life in such a way that time with my children is precious, time spent traveling is done wisely. I'm not going to an office if I don't need to be in an office. And I think, again, it's caused us to question the societal status quo, which I think is not a sensible setup. Indeed. Neil, from your side, please. Yeah, I, I, I kind of look at it a little bit maybe a bit more from the wellness side, but I think what's become very apparent and we see it certainly with, with, with our guests is, is just there's a really 
heightened level of, of, of mindfulness mm -hmm. going on. And, and I, I think, you know, everyone's perhaps saying a little bit the same thing in, in, in different ways, but there, there's a heightened degree of care. I mean, um, w w when we talk to our guests, when we talk to our travel agents, um, you know, as was just said, people have, have stopped booking, you know, three hotels or four places in, in a two week period that, that they want to arrive in a place, they want to be quieter, they want to be calmer, they're, 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 they're more, there's a greater spirituality we're seeing in, in, in our guests. And, and there's a greater engagement um, than ever before in some of the sustainable practices that, that we engage in just because it's our DNA as it relates, say, to local community or if we do like a huge beach cleanup in Vietnam, all of a sudden we've got 25 or 30 guests that are, are coming there and participating with us or, or you know, in one jurisdiction we put putting clean water into a village and, and they want to come and they're interested in that. And, and I mean, that is really, really heartwarming. So, you know, when, when Amanda says it's just going to become uh, the norm in, in hotels or in travel, and tour, uh, I think it will. I, I'm not sure it's going to be quite as rapid as, as perhaps as we would all like it to be, but there's definitely a huge shift and a huge and a greater awareness than there was pre-COVID. So that's wonderful. That's absolutely wonderful. And I think that is our, again, opportunity not to waste. Because if I look at the words you've given, you've talked about humility, humbling, not powerful, as in we, um, mm -hmm. robustness of nature. And also you've been speaking about mindfulness and care, Neil, right now as well. And for all of you, I actually want a little, a little deviation and go to the audience for a second. As you can see, we've got four exquisitely tweetable panelists with us in this panel. So everyone who's watching, please do grab some of these quotes that I've been grabbing on my document, but I can't tweet because I'm managing the session. But please do send these out under the YHS hashtag, under the social platforms. And if you have any questions, please drop them into the Q&A. And we'll absolutely take them and make sure that your voices are heard because these voices are spectacular. But I want to focus on, excuse me, the issue of sustainability, particularly in the context of hospitality. Because if there's anything that I found that I've loved about this last year, which is something that it's not necessarily a year to love, language has changed. People think now about, Neil, to your point, community. We've seen with the streets shutting down, the impact on small businesses, the impact on supply chains. The definition of sustainability has gone beyond the color green. It's cultural, social, economic, and environmental. My question to you all though, is when it comes to the hospitality industry, especially by implication in the luxury sector, often people think, but sustainability doesn't fit. It doesn't fit to take things away from the experience. I would beg to differ. And I'd love to know from your perspectives, what are the opportunities that we now have in rebuilding the hospitality sector in a much more smart, caring, sensitive way when it comes to cultural promotion. Is this something that can be built into the model? Tim, I'd love to know from your perspective, please. I think that hotels have always been a certain uh, driver for cultural norms, cultural standards. I mean, if we way before way before my time but if we look back at what um, especially in switzerland many of these uh, five star palace hotels used to bring towards the whole high society how to behave um, etiquette you know those are things where 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 culture was being taught to people through hospitality to a certain extent and uh, and I think that, yes, we can drive that culture differently nowadays. And uh, in the end, we're not selling hotel rooms. We're not selling just beds. We're selling experiences, I think, all of us in the hospitality field. And a sustainable experience can be 
much more rewarding or is much more rewarding nowadays than just infrastructure of a hotel. I think nobody cares anymore about these these old type of the bling of, of I don't know, golden, go, golden bathtub uh, um, fittings or so. But the experience which the people are going to live while they are in our establishments, uh, traveling the world, seeing different cultures, what we started last summer, for example, is uh, bee workshops. We have our own beehives, and people love it. It's one of the simplest things, you know, but uh, our, our hives are 50 meters away from the hotel. We have a full kit so that there's no risks. Fantastic uh, beekeeper who shares that experience. And it becomes really one of those family activities where you see people coming out and saying, wow, I've learned something. And that learning, that, that cultural awareness, being that platform for exchange I think yes. is something where, where we are very privileged in our field, in our industry, to, to be considered experts. People will travel somewhere and they will listen to you. But you said something really important there, that it's always been innate in the experience, but now it's recognizing that it has increased value and equity in delivering the experience of the brands, which is a perfect segue to Neil. Because it's linking to what Tim has said about the importance of guests wanting to be either overtly or subtly educated in their experience. You've been doing this. I remember years ago when I went to one of your properties in Thailand, you had the gardens right there. You had the workshops right there. And that was part of the joy of the experience. What have you learned that can help the, host, the hospitality sector of the future to build in that education without being lecturing without being judgmental but actually <coughs> Tim's making it part of the richness of the experience well the the, the, the time is right and, I, and as I said earlier I think people are more are more open and more 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 susceptible to it but you know you you mentioned you want your question was kind of around high-end travel and and high-end properties and you know the other the other question to me, you asked how to define sustainability, is is how do people define luxury today? And and to me, that is hugely different to what it was five or ten years ago. And and certainly in our world, um, you know, less is more. Um, what what. What what resonates with people is 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 more than just obviously you know a comfortable bed and and great food and good good service. There has to be a, a takeaway that 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 Tim mentioned and and people people are, are are craving for it today. But I do think you know as 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 an industry we haven't been you know because we're caregivers at heart, you know, certainly in the, in the hotel side of it. And we're always very mindful of what our customers want. But I think as a result of, uh, a result of that, we, is, is, is why it's taken us so long as an industry to really engage in many of these practices and, and, and the way to make progress, there is only, and, and that is to be way more forceful about it relative to to the guest i mean i give this a silly example i mean we, we have never had bottled water you know for 30 years in our in our hotel so plastic is one thing but we won't serve a perrier or a san pellegrino because when we won't ship water halfway around the world so you know we have sophisticated water plants and we make our own water and, and you know we, we got a huge amount of of you know resistance to that right at the beginning what do you mean i can't have a perrier well you can't have a perrier and this is why you can't have a perrier today nobody really okay we un, we understand i mean it's it's one example but you you have to take a position you have to educate your employees, so it, it's got to it's got to be part of the DNA of the organization. Yeah. That is easier today than it was ten or twenty years ago amongst the young people because they're even asking when they go for jobs, "What's your sustainable policy?" You know, and, and, and so on. But we have to be more aggressive as an industry, even if we think it's things that our guests are not going to like, because they will come on board. They will, but
but they won't unless we do it. But you've made such a great point because it's a, and I love your whole take a position because we're not the only ones taking a position. So are the travelers. The right. value of travel has changed and the values of travel has changed. So gentlemen, now comes the fun part because I'm going to turn to the ladies and say, okay, so if the travelers of the past are not the travelers of the present and the future, how are we as travelers going to be measuring sustainability in the future? What are we looking for? What are the metrics of an entity, a brand, a business truly focusing on sustainability and hospitality? Portia, I'd love your thoughts. Um, I think firstly, I kind of want to move away from this concept of travelers and non-travelers. We're all travelers. Um, sometimes I'm moving around the world, sometimes I'm in one spot. And, and I think that's something that you see modern hospitality doing. It's, it's not defining someone as, as a traveler or, or a human. Um, I mean, I love that you said the word metrics because uh, I love data, um, which is not something that I thought I'd be telling the world. But uh, <laughs> one, of the, one of the metrics as someone staying in a hotel or eating in a restaurant or taking a form of transport that I would ask is, do you measure data? Because, um, you know, all of us being up here on a computer screen with an audience in our privileged position, telling the world that we do everything right is one thing, but being able to demonstrate to the world what we're doing is quite another. And I think uh, savvy uh, humans, as they move around the world and experience brands and buy products and services, will start asking, what can this company do to prove that its money is where its mouth is? And I think that systems like B Corp, so benefit corporations, um, companies that are talking about new economic structure like donor economics, um, those are really interesting. If you see someone's B Corp certified, you know they've jumped through a certain number of hoops. It doesn't mean they're perfect, but it means that leadership is thinking in the right way. Um, if I'm staying at a property or if I'm eating in a restaurant, uh, does the waiter uh, have the vocabulary and the information to talk to me about what sustainability means to him or her. Uh, is he aware? Is she aware of what the business is doing? Um, Amanda and I have talked a lot about this because, you know, we, we work with a network of hotels that are trying to define their sustainable regenerative practices. And we found that everyone was able to talk really fluently about waste, water and energy, the typical environmental metrics. But when we started to talk about human inclusion and social justice um, and racial diversity and accessibility, we found that there wasn't that much conversation. There, there, there weren't even the tools out there in the industry to actually measure this. So, you know, one of the kind of awkward moments on one of our big conference calls was, OK, when was the last time that any one of you speaking to a set of properties posted a non-white person on your social media in the position of client, not in a uniform? And, you know, some were like, yeah, we do it all the time. And, and some were like, well, no, 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 but it's just because, you know, we don't have any black clients. It's not because we don't want to post them on social media. And then you're like, okay, but why don't you have any black clients? And then you speak to a black traveler and they say, well, I don't go to places if I don't see myself on the social media. And that's a really, really simple metric. And it's not a metric that's, that involves judgment. It's not saying, you know, you have to post more people of color. You have to post more people with different ability. You have to post more or less of this. It's just sometimes you can use a metric and it can tell you something about your business and it can tell you something about your business, which actually is financially detrimental as well as being perhaps socially or environmentally not that helpful. I could talk about this forever, so I'm going to shut up because I could fill no, 20 minutes with talk about metrics. But it also, it says a great deal about the fact that what we say is one thing, the optics of what we do is another because that's far more honest in terms of, are we being true to what we say or are we being hypocritical about exactly that? Well, I think that, sometimes just is our action fulfilling our intention. And I, and I, you know, I hesitate to say that a property or a restaurant that is saying that they're sustainable is being hypocritical if they're making a mistake. They might just have missed something. I miss things every day. Uh, and people point them out to me. And, and, and that's something that I would also say is let's take a lot of the judgment and the criticism and the blame away from the conversation around doing the right thing. And let's make it more encouraging and say, okay, well, hang on. Oof, that question made me feel uncomfortable, but now I've got the tools to go and change my approach without calling people hypocrites. Absolutely. Brilliant. Amanda, over to you, madam. And I think just to piggyback off what Portia was saying, you know, I think so many 
qualities of established tourism practices. They look at measurement from discrete you know, operations, look at waste, water, energy, and carbon. But from a redundant perspective, we really look at how the ecosystem and human environment are combined. I think something else to note is, you know, one of the key points of how we actually accept a new hotel to the collection is actually through interview with the owners. What's the most important for us is actually that the owners are aligned in our values and have the commitment to furthering their practices and also continually improving. Um, I think also the, the richness of the travel experience and that transformation point that can happen on a journey is also how the hotel was developed. It's really how how did the how the how did the hotelier come into the environment and how did they work with the community to create that have that collaborative approach? Um, we really recently talked to a development property in Indonesia that just got allocated a government piece of land to steward and create an eco theme park, and they have a they have a number of villages and villagers that are on the land and they're asking us how they would respond to the fact that their only request is that they don't that they don't want to move, um, and it's really you know. The first step in more formal regenerative design practice is it's actually hosting a formal stakeholder meeting where all members of the community come together in a charrette to talk about how they can decide on decisions and collaboratively move forward in making a community exercise to build the property. Um, I think Vogue Island Inn is a great example of how pretty much every decision they made from the bathrooms to how they design their concierge to their um, to their to their culinary offering was decided was decided on collaboratively as a community. Um, so you really have to you know go back to the community and ask them you know what do they actually want because they at the end of the day when the guest comes and stays at the hotel that is how, how that's how they experience the community. Brilliant, and I think I love the fact that you've actually taken it back to as you say an ecosystem, and central to that ecosystem is the community itself, internal and external. <laughs> We're now going to shift quickly to the questions, because ultimately this is about the audience and making sure that they can really learn from all of you as strongly as possible. So, Neil, I'm going to ask you the first question, and it says, people tend to think that sustainability is costly and expensive to businesses to incorporate and implement in their lifestyles um, and sometimes even in their businesses. How can you help in circumventing this problem and inspiring people to be more proactive and take up sustainability as part of their responsibility? Any thought on that? Uh, yeah, I, 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 I mean, it's, it's education. I, I, I mean, we argue less today, but we used to argue a lot with developers who kind of owned our hotels and they, oh, you know, we do everything you want us to do. It's going to cost us 10% or 20% or 30% more. And, 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 you know, firstly today it doesn't need to, but it, it all comes back down to the intention and the coming from and, 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 you know, what are you feeling? What is in your heart? How are we as stewards of other people's properties able to drive an agenda and how anyone is able to drive an agenda that, that is going to accomplish, accomplish the goals? And it takes a lot of conversation sometimes and a lot of convincing and, and a lot of training, but it, it's the only way to do it. There's, there's, there's no easy way. But I, but I also believe, I mean, you know, we're a bit different because we have been doing it for so many years, but, and some of the topics that are being talked about, this group are very lofty and very big and important topics. But I also believe that small steps are okay too. And small steps are better than no steps at all. And, and whatever people can achieve, and different businesses will go at different pace with different accomplishments, but it's okay as long as companies and organizations are moving forward. It's, it's never going to be as fast as we would like it to be, but I don't think we should kind of poo-poo the smaller gains, you know, because sometimes that's all people can do. We got to keep pushing. As I said, we got to be aggressive, but, but it's one step at a time. Indeed, I always think of when you say that that um, if you think of the Arab Spring, it started with one person with a cell phone and a Facebook account, but it's having oh, people, as you say, sure. take a position sure. and allow that groundswell. Mm -hmm. Taking a position, Tim, a very interesting question for you. 
Swiss Meteo predicts that resorts at around 1,500 meters will lose about 100 days of snow. You are at 1,050 meters in altitude. How are you preparing for this future, sir? Very valid question. And uh, snow has been a problem for many years already. And uh, and uh, this year was actually quite phenomenal. Now, <laughs> we had more snow than other years. Uh, could that be linked to already a micro change in the climate because there have been less planes around for the last 12 months? I don't know. I'm not a scientist. I'm not going to pretend to be one. But the uh, fact is we had a lot more snow this year. And we generally always close our winter seasons mid-March because we don't have much snow left. This time mid-March, we had another nearly a meter fresh snow. We are setting a lot more on other experiences, though. People do not need to come only for the skiing. I think the Alps are beautiful all year round. We have longer and longer summer seasons. People are realizing that there is a lot to, to the Alps, to the nature of the mountains, even during non-ski periods. That maybe your connection with nature is even better when you're not skiing. That uh, you don't need a lot of snow to, to go on a winter hike but uh, you may be even more lucky to see uh, more um, fauna because, because it's quiet, because it's less crowded. So there are definitely other experiences which are much more linked to the beautiful panorama of, of the mountains as opposed to that winter sport itself. So we are aware of the problem. We are not a ski resort as such. Yes, we're an alpine resort, but we're not a ski resort as such. And we really want to position ourselves as a place where you have different elements to your experience, be it the gastronomic aspect, be it the sports aspect, be it the wellness aspect, which is very important as well, as Neil was also mentioning, to be able to differentiate and to be able to target all year round. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And it's great because, it, to your point, it addresses issues around seasonality. It addresses issues as a result around employment and revenue. So that actually helps to that diversification away from the cold and the white. I'm going to ask, now we have effectively... 180 seconds left. So I've got the tight challenge of trying to wrap this up in three, in three minutes. However, before I do, I'm going to ask very quickly, very, very quickly. Can I ask, please, Portia, the question that goes to you. You stated that your business is transitioning into a benefit-led corporation. What does that mean and, uh, how a and how a company is run under this framework? Can you explain B Corp very quickly? 30-second challenge, madam. Our triple bottom line. Uh, so traditionally, businesses measure a bottom line. That's on your PL, It's your profit or your loss. The triple bottom line says, what are my financial results? It also says, what are my social results? And it says, what are my environmental results? And if you have a truly successful business, you are net positive environmentally, socially, and financially. And the reason to make it a B Corp and to, and to make it a legal structure is so that if I decide to give up and go away and leave my business to somebody else, that person is obliged to follow the corporate governance that we've put in place using the B Corp structure. So it's about creating a stable legacy that takes into account the three major things necessary for actual sustainability. Stunning. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Amanda, 30 second challenge to you. Please, can you explain what role do travelers play in the regenerative travel cycle? 30 seconds. Travel has the capacity to change and inspire everyone to be better citizen in your day-to-day -day life. It's, you know, are you going to, how, you know, how are you going to eat? How are you going to shop? What, you know, what companies are going to support? I think it's, you know, the travel experience you can have while you're abroad can ultimately influence how you behave in your day-to-day -day life. And that's really, I think what it's all about is to be inspired and to ultimately bring that back home with you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And I must say, we've got now 120 seconds, and I'm going to use these to thank, firstly, the audience for sending through the questions. And I must say, this is the first time I've had a panel of this subject matter with such attitude, and I've just loved it. So thank you for that. Because importantly, sustainability usually hits the end of programs. We've always seen that in conferences. But why I just put this as the finale of the summit itself as an exclamation mark? Because all of you have been talking about making sure that 
Is our action fulfilling our intentions? Take a position because now the future of travel is about accountability, transparency, and humility, recognizing there's an ecosystem that we are all going to be held accountable to. So I thank all of you to all of you for your contribution. Thank you enormously. I'm sure YHS is going to get your blessing to share your email addresses for anyone wanting to do any follow up itself. To YHS, thank you for giving me the honor of this incredibly valuable and very precious stage. And congratulations on your 11th anniversary and your first year of being the champions in pivoting from live events to virtual like no one in the hospitality industry had done a year ago. And thank you for the support of RISE earlier this week. From my side to everyone, stay safe, stay strong, stay hopeful. And as we say on RISE, keep your hands clean. Thank you, everyone. Take great care. And I hand it now back to the YHS team. Thank you so much for that really inspirational panel about sustainability and what it takes to, to keep this world running. You know, in the discussion, it was talked about how climate change would be as though the next season, as of this moment, we're dealing with the pandemic and we're dealing to get past it. But we should not set aside that climate change is real and that it must be taken care of to make sure that the new modern hospitality of technology, sustainability, caregiving, and, and making sure that the environment is safe is going to be in good hands. So that was great. And I also loved when you guys mentioned that the future of travelers are no longer looking for a vacation spot, but looking for a new place to live. So that's that was really cool. Thank you so much. Kate, what have you have to say? Um, so one of my highlights was actually hearing from the CEO of a company, straight from the CEO of a company like Six Senses, Mr. Jacobs, when he was talking about the touches like not importing water bottles. And we have had experience at, at Six Senses locations noticing that the water bottles actually come from around the area. And just to hear about these, these small details that hotels can do as the leader of culture to show uh, to show the guests what the culture is like coming on to and, and how we're, where we should go in the future with sourcing sustainably. So thank you very much for, for all those insights. Panelists, we thank you for your time. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and thank you so much for being part of YHS 2021. It was a pleasure to see you all and meet you all. Thank you so much, everyone. Hello. Bye. Have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> All right, everybody, and as we wave goodbye to our panelists, we would like to remind the YHS 2021 student delegates that after a short break, we will continue with the challenge presentation. So we'll see you in a few minutes to our delegates and to our audience members. We will see you all back here at 315 to hear from Mr. Craig Kogut about investing in a greener future. Bye, see you in a moment. <laughs>